Hey guys, it's me, Omar from the Horror Highway, and uh, welcome to the Wisconsin Darkest Iceberg, or whatever I call it. Uh, for this video, it was like a toss-up between Wisconsin and Kansas, so I just flipped a coin. It landed on Wisconsin, so I'm doing Wisconsin. I'll probably do Kansas next, and then on the Kansas video, whatever people comment the next day, that'll be the next date I do. As you can see, the iceberg is pretty filled compared to the other states. I would like to say that Wisconsin has a huge amount of ocean dwelling cryptids that's kind of insane so yeah shout out jillian amber 3596 for the wisconsin video idea and shout out to the r slash cryptid subreddit because they made a wisconsin thread and there's a user on reddit who goes by night of wisconsin who basically laid out like the whole list of almost every cryptid in wisconsin so it made the search for all of this stuff much easier anyways there's the iceberg uh should be up on the video right now and speaking of that let's get into the video right now Tier 1 The Hodag In the town of Rhinelander, Wisconsin, known for its lumbering, the legend of a creature known as the Hodag would be created in around the 1800s. Becoming well known in 1893 thanks to a lumberman known as Eugene Jean Shepard who went about reporting the beast with supposed photographic evidence of it, supposedly standing at 7 feet long, 30 inches tall, and having an estimated weight of 200 pounds. The Hodag is described as having the head of a frog, a grinning face of a giant elephant, thick short legs with huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and having a tail that ended with a spear. Supposedly it also had green eyes, huge fangs, and two horns sprouting from its temples. When Eugene Shepard started circulating the story of the Hodag, it was said that a group of local hunters went out to hunt it down, and after failing to kill it the first time, they went back out, this time armed with dynamite and supposedly successfully killed it. But then, three years later, Shepard would claim to have captured a live hodag, not by himself, mind you, but with some bear wrestlers and chloroform. With this hodag in his possession, he toured around with the Oneida County Fair, making people pay if they wanted to observe the creature. But soon, news would spread far and wide about this hodag, and so people came to investigate it. And that's when Shepard had to admit that the hodag he had been touring around the state was in fact a hoax. The Hodag would sort of become an unofficial mascot of the town of Rhinelander, which is where the Hodag was found and killed, the first time at least. And that town has sort of kept the legend alive and, and the Hodag has found itself in various media because of it, making it gain kind of like a cult following. Mini Mastodons Just like the pterosaurs of Wisconsin, another ancient creature seems to roam the state, this time smaller version of it. Now, if you don't know what a mastodon is, it's in a general sense, it's just a much older mammoth. Though not directly related, it is a cousin of the creature. And by much older, I mean much older. Woolly mammoths are estimated to have shown up around 5 million years ago, while mastodons were on the earth 27 to 30 million years ago. Also, mastodons were shorter, typically than mammoths, and their tusks were less curved and shorter. That being said, both were basically furry elephants. And the theory as to how the Mastodons are still alive to this day was essentially they went into hiding after the rise of man and you know, through natural selection it became more beneficial if the creature became shorter and shorter as it were hiding, which made it harder for the humans to track and find, which is kind of hard to believe because past humans were very good trackers, or generally good trackers I should say. And again, that's just a theory as to how many Mastodons could still be alive. Now if you're wondering how short they supposedly got, think about the size of a big dog basically so like so probably around three to four feet despite shrinking that much due to evolution the creature still kept almost every other characteristic of it so it still looked like a woolly mammoth or hairy elephant whatever now this is more of a folk legend and basically the idea was that these creatures were just out in the wild in wisconsin typically in the southwest area and that they were just as common as a raccoon the folk legend goes that the downfall of this creature started occurring around 1929 Basically, when the Great Depression hit, people were hungry, people needed to eat, and you had people with no money. So the conclusion was that people started hunting these creatures down for food and for money. Though supposedly the hunting made them go near extinct, they didn't go extinct. And it said around 1933, the creature had become fully domesticated within human life. Well, within these Wisconsin people's lives, I should say. And owning one became a status symbol, because obviously it's now a nearly extinct creature. But now another problem arose. These domesticated mini mastodons no longer wanted to breed. Though supposedly some mini mastodons were still out in the wild, as rich people kept them as pets 
uh, it became popular and trendy to keep them as pets and more and more people started to bring them in and domesticate them and basically the story ends how you think it would with them becoming extinct due to them no longer breeding and it said that the species died off officially in 1944 though supposedly you can still find some out in the wilds of Wisconsin in that southwest region but again this whole thing was basically a folk tale so believe what you want to believe the man-faced pigs in the town of Brussels, Wisconsin, between the 1800s and the 1900s, something came to the town of Brussels that frightened everyone. While the date isn't known, the urban legend behind this whole tale begins like this. A man was cut out of the will from his family in Belgium. Enraged, he blamed the clergymen from Belgium and cursed them, as well as the clergymen in the town of Brussels as well. The curse would backfire. Instead, he would end up being cursed, and later that night, strange poltergeist-like activity began happening around his house, as well as supposedly the sound of a fiddle playing. It was the next morning, when he went out to look at his animals, that he then noticed that the pigs now had demonic human-like faces. Also, to add to the strangeness, the pigs now seemed attracted to the farmer and would follow him everywhere, whether that be going into town or just staying at home. Days would go by, and feeling like he was losing his sanity, he went to a neighbor and told him about the curse and asked if they knew of a way to get rid of him. The neighbor suggested that he just pray to God for forgiveness and make a shrine for him on his land. So the farmer did this and supposedly after praying, the pig's faces went back to normal. The Rhinopolis. If you've seen my previous icebergs, I usually put in a hoax cryptid or like hoax story usually because despite whatever the entry is, there's still a community and story formed around the hoax. And the same goes for the Rhinopolis, except it isn't really a hoax, it's more of like a, it's more of like a statement. Specifically towards the Hodag, basically the story goes that a man named Guy Daly was out in the swamp near the town of Monaco, Wisconsin, and came across this large tree branch that had, that had three outstretching arms, and he looked at it and he saw a rhino, an elephant, and an octopus, and he just came up with Rhinopolis, he, that's just like the first thing he saw, basically an art piece. He took it back to town. He kind of kept it preserved and sort of this myth of this tree being a monster was kind of formed and it eventually became an attraction for the town. The tree branch was kept yellow but it would eventually be painted green and basically it's just been sort of taken care of by the town of Monaco. You know they, they let kids play around it, it's just sort of an attraction for the town. There's no real myth about it besides that it came from the swamps but there is kind of like a description of what it is. There's pictures in the video but I'll still describe it. It's a giant green monster except its feet are white. It has one giant red eye and one horn at the neck of it? I would describe it as a neck. It's assumed to walk like a giant spider and is kind of described as lizard-like. And again, the whole reason for this creature being here is just sort of to make a statement about the Hodag. It's not really to make fun of the town of Rylander, which is where the Hodag is like said to live, but it's more just like a, hey, you guys got a cryptid, we got one too. Isn't that kind of cool? You know, just sort of like building community within the two towns. The Kidrick Swamp What's It Located in the Kidrick Swamp State Natural Area, which is about 4,000 acres, and is a part of the Shaquamagan Nicolette National Forest. Now, according to the information I've read, which comes from the Pine Barren Institute, the source of this cryptid came from a book called Giants in the Land, Folk Tales and Legends of Wisconsin by Dennis Boyer, which was written in 1997. And again, according to the Pine Barrens Institute, the issue with the Watsa is that there's so little info on it that people don't even recognize that they're all identifying the same cryptid, so it goes by many different names. Some people even think of it just as a devil monkey or maybe a Bigfoot. But now let's get into the description of the creature. It has four legs and it walks on all four legs. It's said to look like something in between a possum and an alligator, that it has really small feet, and that it slinks in between the shrubbery and fallen trees that are in the swamp. It's said to be covered in red fur and has horns on its head. Though there are many different sightings of the creature, so that description isn't the only one that people have said is the what's it. Some people said it looked like a mishmash of a hippo and an ox. Others said it was just a chimera of different creatures that live within the swamp. Now, again, going back to the book, Giants in the Land, Folk Tales and Legends of Wisconsin, this is where we get a written account of an encounter with the what's it. The account comes from a U.S. Forest Service employee, who just goes by Peyton in the book. Now, the U.S. Forest Service employee had already heard tales of the what's it within the swamp, 
but you always just thought they were rumors or just some animal that people misidentified but that all changed Peyton was just doing his job that's when we noticed something at the edge of his vision something the size of a large dog just quickly moving behind bushes and trees then he started to notice reddish brown fur just kind of stuck around the shrubbery around him looking around he noticed a strange creature by some trees it was clearly covered in the reddish brown fur he saw around him he started inspecting the creature more he noticed the horns growing out of its head another thing he realized upon inspecting the creature was something described as patches of rhinoceros skin below the fur the creature was thin and had a completely hairless tail behind it yellow eyes and a very large mouth upon fully inspecting the creature it just turned around and ran away and the u.s forest service employee hasn't ever seen the creature since that being said it's it's kind of a native legend of the kidrick swamp so sightings of it still occur to this day phantom kangaroos phantom kangaroos doesn't actually refer to ghost kangaroos but rather it's the idea that an animal that shouldn't be within the state is there it's being witnessed by multiple people and it does physically affect like the areas around it and it's not exactly a cryptid because we know what kangaroos are when people identify a kangaroo there's no confusion with some sort of other animal now, there have been a lot of reports of kangaroos in wisconsin i mean one of the earliest reportings is in 1899 in new richmond wisconsin when a woman claimed that a kangaroo just walked across her yard and these reportings still persist till the modern day one i easily found on the internet talks about when in 2019 on the interstate 41 there was a bridge in a town called grand chute where a motorist reported seeing a kangaroo just walk across the road but sometimes these kangaroos are just pranks like in 1978 in the town of wakusha when two brothers made a fake kangaroo out of plywood and used it to prank kids when people started getting scared that it might spread some sort of disease, the brothers came out and told everyone it was just a prank. Meanwhile, other times, such as in Dodgeville, Wisconsin 2005, there straight up just was a absolutely real non-phantom kangaroo running around the town. Police and animal control were sent in to capture it and it was found inside a barn just kind of hiding and they would eventually send it to a zoo where it would live until it died in 2008. There was an investigation that tried to figure out where this very real non-phantom kangaroo came from but no explanation was found. Bigfoot With a total of 105 reported sightings, at least according to the Bigfoot Research Organization, Wisconsin has many tales of the Bigfoot within its state. Most of these sightings occurring in the Marionette, Price, Villas, Oconto, and Oneida counties. All of these sightings within Wisconsin occurring around a wooded slash foresty area so many people are just capturing a glimpse of a large bipedal hairy monster either walking across the road or dashing through the forest the monster of lake pippin peppy so if you don't know much about wisconsin basically the border of wisconsin and minnesota is the mississippi river and within the mississippi river there's lake pippin so this monster is really a toss-up between wisconsin and minnesota it could be either or since it's like on the border but i just put it here because i read about it here first the tale of pepe goes back all the way to the native indigenous people who claim that there was some large serpent like monster within the lake and those tales still persist even to this day people are pretty convinced about the existence of pepe that a man put a $50,000 reward for proof of Pepe's existence. A lot of people have claimed the scene Pepe, and for the most part, the sea monster is described the same way as almost every other sea monster in Wisconsin so far, a giant serpent-like creature. But there are some who say it looks more like the Loch Ness Monster than a snake. And all those sightings are plentiful of the creature. To this day, evidence of the actual creature remains elusive. Thunderbirds well, by the very nature of it being a bird, it's not really bound to one state. We've been meaning to cover this one, but, but usually it just gets lost in the large number of urban legends and cryptids that get put on the list for the icebergs. If you've never had a thunderbird described to you, it's basically just a really big hawk or a really big eagle-like bird who kind of has control and dominion over the sky. A lot of the urban legends for thunderbird start with myths from the native indigenous people of the United States of America, or the Native Americans. From tribe to tribe, they're slightly different, but the general idea stays the same, like a giant guardian animal. Specifically, when it comes to Wisconsin, there's this native myth of the Thunderbirds going to battle with water spirits within Devil Lake. And that story goes to tell why Devil's Lake is filled with so many destroyed rocks and everything, because the tale goes that, that the Thunderbirds would launch down lightning bolts and swoop down at the water to attack the water spirits, and that the water spirits would throw rocks at them, spreading rocks everywhere, and destroying the area around it. 
which when it was first found by white settlers was described as like near impassable and just completely rugged and filled with rocks. The myth ended with the Thunderbirds successfully destroying all the water spirits and returning to their nest where they would take care of themselves and their young. Another thing I saw online was that, that these water spirits were probably the great horned serpents I mentioned earlier in the video. And the water spirits and the great horned spirits were seen as like evil dark entities while the Thunderbirds were seen more as like the good guys. The Mostyn Birdman In the town of Mostyn, there's an old story of a giant bird-human hybrid who comes out of the darkness to scare people and that's kind of basically it to be honest. There's a lot of personal stories out there of people just seeing this thing and you know being scared and terrified by it. The description of it is rather strange. It's said to be covered with large round feathers and very tall and it's also said to have very thick legs with claws on the toes and stands about six feet tall. Despite being covered in feathers, it still retains its humanoid shape and the feathers are said to be yellow, kind of like Big Bird. A really strange thing about the Birdman is that despite it being a Birdman, no one has ever seen it fly. The Lake Monona Monster The legend for this monster basically begins in 1892 when a man from Oregon was visiting Lake Monona. He basically rented a boat and went out paddling to the lake in order to fish and while that was happening something rose to the surface of the lake and then began to attack him. He would describe it as 20 feet long with a large head that was flat on top. The man seeing this would quickly drop everything and began rowing back towards the pier where he got his boat away from the monster he saw. There were some reported sightings beforehand but again it was just people who witnessed something coming out from the lake and they weren't sure what it was. It's assumed that it was this serpent like monster. It was several years later while the lake was being dredged that a sand pipe had been blocked off by several huge vertebrae that belonged to the skeleton of a serpent. It is believed that this serpent was the Lake Monona monster and that it no longer resides within the lake. Lake Geneva Jenny First spotted in 1892 by three swimmers, it was in the summer on July 22nd that the monster who would become known as Jenny would be witnessed by people. Its first encounter was not a friendly one as it's claimed that it was chasing three swimmers down and the swimmers absolutely terrified of whatever was following them made their way back to shore as quickly as possible. And as the three swimmers got out of the lake safely, they noticed it was making loud noises and slithering like a snake. They would go on to describe the creature as being a 65 foot long serpent that was scaly green and the body being 8 to 10 inches in diameter with having a head that was 3 feet wide. More sightings of the creature would occur and Jenny would become known for tipping over small boats. But the last reported sighting of the creature was in 1902 and hasn't really been seen since. The Lake Winnebago Monster Believed to be the monster that the native indigenous people of Wisconsin talked about in their legend of the lake. It is supposed to be a large monster that no one's really been able to describe. But what is known is that it has a humongous appetite. Said to eat deer, elk, and even mooses whole. Though some people do believe it to be just a large sturgeon. This fish monster waits around the Fox River waiting for animals to get close to the river to then snatch them up and eat them. There's even a story of it coming onto shore to eat a deer and when locals found the creature they decided to cut it open to find the deer inside the creature. Now you're probably wondering if the legend goes that they found it on shore and they cut it open shouldn't it be dead? Well people believe that it's had children in the lake because sightings still persist. Rocky the Rock Lake Terror Sightings of this creature date back to 1869 when people were observing the lake and then they noticed something hissing at them from the shallows. There's been many stories since of a creature within Rock Lake. Supposedly, a man got dragged half a mile across the lake when he hooked a creature before the line broke. Another time, in 1882, two men were racing each other towards a submerged sandbar when suddenly that sandbar started moving and out from the lake came a snake-like head. The head then stared at the man and opened its jaw. The men, feeling threatened, quickly raced back to shore on their boats, trying to find a gun, but when they made it back, the creature was already gone. After that incident in 1882, sightings of Rocky would be sparse. In 1943, a man would claim to have seen it, but that's the last time people believe Rocky would be seen, as many believe that the creature has now died due to old age or some sort of sickness. Rocky is described as snake-like, a large serpent monster with a mouth filled with lots of teeth. And of course, there is a tale from the native indigenous people of the area of a monster living within the lake. Describing the beast that lives within the lake 
as a serpent with very white jaws and a whole lot of teeth. The obvious conclusion that many people have come to is that Rocky is in fact this creature. Tier 2 The Whitewater Lake Monster In 1923, a fisherman's boat would be tipped over. As he entered the lake to fix this, he felt something grab him and begin to drag him down into the lake, something he would describe as tentacles. And that was the only mention of the Whitewater Lake Monster up until 1992 when on a summer night three friends were walking along a beach at whitewater lake and that's when they noticed something strange a group of figures dancing and chanting near the beach at first it was strange but not that unusual but then something really weird began to happen supposedly according to the friends some sort of creature began to come out of the lake as the creature approached the group of people who were chanting and dancing the three friends noticed that they were all robed in black after witnessing this, the three friends would run back to the cabin they were staying at and reported this to the police, but not before going back the next morning to find a burnt pile and small animal bones near it. The three friends feared what they had encountered was some sort of ritual for summoning the Whitewater Lake Monster. The Lake Michigan Monster Yeah, I know this is Wisconsin. Yeah, and already did Lake Pepin, which is like half in Minnesota, half Wisconsin. But Lake Michigan is also in Wisconsin, so... Yeah, sightings of a mysterious monster within Lake Michigan goes back all the way to the native indigenous people of Wisconsin. There, it was described as something known as the Great Horned Serpent, though a lot of the native indigenous people that were near lakes had their own version of the Great Horned Serpent. It's just that the one in Lake Michigan was considered like greater because Lake Michigan's much deeper, bigger. You know, it is one of the Great Lakes. Though the creature in Lake Michigan hasn't always been described as a snake serpent. For instance, on August 3rd, 1867, the Daily Ohio Statesman would tell the story of a man from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who described encountering a well within the lake. About a little over two weeks later, the Chicago Tribune would write its own article about a strange part fish, part serpent-like creature within Lake Michigan, being described as bluish black in color and getting around grayish white towards the head and the tail, with a triangular shaped head and that it looked sort of like a seal with two large eyes and was described as being as thick as a barrel. There would be more and more reported sightings of the creature throughout 1867, but as the year ended, the sightings winded down and eventually almost just stopped altogether until 1885 when once again another newspaper, the Portland Daily, reports a sighting that someone had of a sea monster within Lake Michigan. Sightings would be sporadic to say the least. Stories would come out of a man seeing a large snake serpent within Lake Michigan and then a bunch of stories would pop up around that. But then over time, the stories would slowly fade and less and less sightings would occur. And that's kind of just what kept happening within Lake Michigan up until around 1934 where the last like real sighting of it was seen. And basically after that sighting, which was basically a ship captain wondering what was paddling around his boat. And then he ordered some people to put some lights within the lake and they saw the tail of something that was about 60 foot long just flap up and down and disappear. The stories of the serpent-like monster would just start fading away. And strangely enough though, in 1955, stories would pop up again, but this time it wasn't of a snake-like serpent, rather it was of a shark-like monster. Supposedly, the shark had attacked a boy in 1955, although whether this actually happened or is just a made-up story can be verified. There is a story of two men finding a shark within Lake Michigan, but, but that all turned out to be a prank done by a lawyer who just had a shark body in a freezer basically and one day they just threw it within the lake and sort of just wanted a lot of attention and they figured that was the quickest way to do it. Supposedly there was a video captured in 2019 of the serpent-like fish monster within Lake Michigan, but obviously most people have their doubts about it. Bozo, aka the Lake Wabusa monster, first spotted in 1860 by a couple that was rowing their boat. When they hit what they thought was a log with their paddles, it quickly saw it swim away. More sightings of a creature that would become to known as the Bozo would appear within Lake Mandata. The next sighting of the creature would occur with a married couple who were out rowing their boat on the lake. While they were out there, something started bumping into their boat. That's when they noticed a creature appear from the surface of the lake, a 25 feet long greenish black snake. The creature kept getting close to their boat and kept hitting it with its body. The reason for this isn't known, but it's assumed that it was trying to tip the boat over. Eventually, after a couple of hits, the husband picked up a hatchet he had in the boat and struck at the creature as it got close and it finally left him alone. 
letting them go back to shore. More and more sightings would occur. People would see Bozo surfacing from the lake, just kind of swimming around and stuff. He seemed to avoid people for the most part. There was even a monster hunt for him after a certain amount of sightings, but no one ever actually was able to capture him or anything. But in 1917, a large sea serpent scale would be found within the lake. The scale would be taken to a university to be identified and it wouldn't be able to be identified. So many people just came to the conclusion that it was one of Bozo's scale. And after that, sightings would slowly become sparse, and basically after the 1940s, sightings of Bozo would stop in the lake, many people believing it took the Yahara River and left. This is where the Lake Wabusa monster comes in, as it's one of the lakes connected to Lake Mondanta through the Yahara River, and it is believed that this is where Bozo went to. But the first official sighting of the Lake Wabusa monster appearing in the 1920s, so you know, just, just kind of in the time frame where Bozo was gone from the other lake. With the first sighting of the Lake Wabusa monster being seen by a fisherman who went out to go fish, and while fishing, he noticed some commotion happening within the lake, and it slowly approached him, and as it got closer to him, he described a giant eel coming out of the water, it being about 60 to 70 feet long. It also had dark green skin, but it was only above the lake for a couple of minutes before it just went back down under. The next sighting was by a couple who were just out swimming in the lake. They were swimming by the shore next to their cabin when they noticed a large snake head coming out of the water and slowly getting closer towards them. They panicked and they ran back on shore and then quickly into their cabin. And from out the window, they could see this snake-like creature just above the surface of the water just waiting. And then it eventually just went back underwater. And that would basically be like the last official sighting of the Lake Wabusa monster. Most people assume it's left both lakes by this point because there have been sightings of the creature in a very long time. Red Cedar Lake Monster slash Lake Ripley Monster. Now while these are two different lakes, it is commonly believed that there's an underground water tunnel that connects the two lakes. So the theory goes that the two monsters sighted within these two lakes are actually the same monster. And they're both described the same as they're both described as having serpentine bodies. The monster seen at the Red Cedar Lake was seen by a bunch of Germans and all they saw do was laze around the river and eventually come to shore and just sort of sunbathe. There was a farmer who claimed the large sea serpent took five of his sheep. The sighting for this monster occurred on June 9th, 1892. The story goes that the monster stayed there for about the whole of June and the month after disappeared. It would then be four years later in 1895 when the same monster appeared again, but this time in Lake Ripley. The first sighting came from three women who noticed a strange bubbling occurring within the ocean and they also noticed that it was getting closer to them. This frightened them and it wasn't until the very last moment that it hit them that they should be fleeing from this thing that they ran away and they reported it to people around the town that there was something strange in Lake Ripley. In around December, people were harvesting ice from the lake after the lake had frozen over. Some people decided to harvest the ice from the center of the lake and while at the center, a man noticed a large snake-like shadow slivering under the ice. The story goes that the man walked about a hundred feet till they reached what was assumably the head of the monster. That's when the snake started breaking through the ice. Obviously this terrified everyone and so they ran away and when they turned around the snake had broken the ice but was already back under the lake. Then in the summer of 1896 more sightings would occur, this time from people vacationing by the lake. The story goes that some people witnessed the monster toss a platform that was anchored to the lake and that the monster also happened to kill pets and livestock in the area. Hunting parties would be brought to the lake in order to try to subdue this monster, but they could never find it. And sightings go on, even to this day. The Rock River Sea Monster Another snake-like monster in Wisconsin, this time inside of a river instead of a lake. It's described to have a dinosaur-like head and is estimated to be around 10 to 15 feet long. The legends go that the native indigenous people of Wisconsin used to offer up tobacco to this monster in order to appease it. When white settlers moved in and those offerings stopped, it was noticed that livestock by the river would end up disappearing and it was assumed that the Rock River monster was the one taking the livestock. The last sighting of it was in the 1960s by a man who was walking over a bridge who said he just saw it peek its head out for a couple of seconds before it went back inside the river. There have been many people who have tried to capture this monster, but none have been successful. The Steinthal Beast Within the Manawak County of Wisconsin, during the 1960s, teenagers were just out having fun exploring. They would find an abandoned house that was said to be haunted, an old rundown farmhouse. While exploring the farmhouse, something happened. They would run into a seven foot tall, hairy white monster. This tall, white, hairy creature had one distinctive feature, two 
green glowing eyes. The story goes that these teenagers quickly ran to their car because the swamp is very far away from the closest town and started driving all the way back to their house. But as they were driving back, so stricken by fear, they would unfortunately be struck by a drunken driver. Now, if the tale of the Steinthel monster is real, is not known, but that accident did occur and the creature has now become tied to that story. But that isn't the only story about the Steinthel monster and they all go similarly with teenagers going to the farmhouse known as the Schweitzer farm and seeing the creature, though it wasn't always described exactly the same way. Some teens described the creature as having three eyes. Others said it was covered in a dark fur, not a white fur. Another description of the creature said that its eyes were two axe handles apart, which I really don't know how far away that would be. It's a really country way to describe something. And also the height of the creature always changed, generally staying between six to nine feet tall, but always in between those heights. The creature said to still roam the Schweitzer farm. Some believe it to be a black bear. Others believe it to be a Bigfoot-like creature. While others claim that it was a deer hiding in the shadows, simply standing on its hind legs and moving its head very quickly, making it seem as if its eyes were very far apart. Devil's Lake Monster. Now, I don't know where I'm gonna place this. Uh, should be early on now that since I'm mentioning this, but there's a lot of lakes in Wisconsin and within all those lakes and rivers and just water pond areas, there's a lot of creatures. So I'm just putting that out there right now. The Nakota Sui who lived around that lake had a name for it, Mariwakan or Bad Spirit. Now it was called this because the legend goes that many people that as soon as they got near the lake would be dragged by some sort of tentacle-like thing. The legend goes on that one time during a drought in the area, the lake started to shrink and that one morning, the people woke to find some sort of squid-like creature flailing about as it was on dry land and it was trying to make its way to the remaining bit of water that was still within the lake. Now, sightings of this creature still persist to this day and again, it's all just sightings and hearsay. But because it's a squid-like creature, there is kind of a small group of people who believe that maybe this is all somehow connected to some like some sort of Cthulhu cults and whatnot. As there's a lot of lake monsters in Wisconsin and a lot of lakes. And you know a squid conjures up the image of Cthulhu. But that's just more like theories and stuff. The Lake Kushkoning Monster This lake has rock river flowing through it. So as it comes to no one's surprise, there seems to be a large snake serpent that lives within this lake. Though it doesn't seem to be the same beast as the Rock River Monster. Lake Kushkoning is pretty shallow, being only about a max of 7 feet deep. But besides that, there have been a total of 6 sightings for this monster. The most famous one made the local newspaper and supposedly happened in 1887. When two dog hunters witnessed something coming out of the lake, they described it as a moving head that was about 2 feet above the water, with 10 feet of its thick, roughly 8 inch trunk visible above the water. As the men witnessed the monster, they estimated that the length of the monster would be about 30 to 40 feet, but when they began to get closer to get a better look, the monster went back underwater and disappeared from them. The Mineral Point Vampire in the small lead mining town of Mineral Point, there was once a reported sighting of a vampire. People started calling the police because strange people were jumping out of the shadows and scaring them. Strangely enough, just before all of these sightings happened, a police officer was patrolling the cemetery when he noticed a strange man late into the night in the cemetery. When he went to inquire about the man's business and flashed a light at him, he described seeing a huge person with a white painted face that also wore a cape. The police officer began chasing the man. The man started fleeing from the officer, escaping the cemetery. The officer would say the man stood about six foot three, and ever since that incident, those reports of strange men jumping out of the shadows began. The people who were jumping out of the shadows were all described very similarly, with very strange pale faces. The faces being described as almost painted white. The police mainly believed that these were just pranksters trying to scare people, but who really knows? The Eau Beast The story goes that a woman was driving home from work. She was on Highway 37, watching the sides of the roads, being wary of all the animals. That's when she noticed something on the side of the road. At first, she believed it to either be a deer or a bear. And obviously, having a deer or a bear try to cross the road while you're driving is something you don't want to happen, so you gotta be very aware of it. So she started slowing down. And as she got closer, she noticed something. This was neither a bear or a deer. This was a giant dog with red eyes, a hellhound. As soon as she noticed this, 
she drove away as fast as she could, absolutely terrified of what she had seen. This was not the first time the Eclair Beast was witnessed. There have been several other reports on Highway 53 of a huge black dog with red eyes. Supposedly, around 1908, there was a newspaper article about a large beast believed to be a panther around Eau Claire, with the farmers of the area finding their livestock killed and devoured. It's even said to have followed several young children home from school. The Mishi Peshu, aka the Great Lynx, also known as the Underwater Panther. This cryptid isn't specifically a Wisconsin cryptid, rather it's more of a Great Lakes cryptid where sightings are reported all around the Great Lakes and many of the native indigenous tribes that lived around the Great Lakes all have a native myth of the Mishipeshu. Some of these tribes being the Algonquin, Ottawa, Minomi, Shawnee, and Cree. This cryptid is described as sort of a snake serpent slash panther hybrid or kind of dragon slash panther hybrid and is basically said to have control over the weather and the lake itself, causing whirlpools, storms, all sorts of things in order to just drive people out of the lake. The Mishi Peshu is also said to have horns and scales. The Holy Cross Gnomes It is said that on the Holy Cross Road, there's a railroad track, and that if you pick up a rock that's on this railroad track and throw it into the woods, it will be thrown back at you. And this is said to be done by gnomes that live in the forest. It's said it's bad luck to do this, and that when they throw the rock back at you, you're getting cursed. There's also another tale involving the railroad, but it has nothing to do with gnomes. Rather, it's about a mother who was driving with her family in the car and trying to beat the train, drove across the railroad, but didn't pass it in time, and her whole family perished on the railroad tracks. It's said that if you leave your car on the railroad tracks, the family will start pushing you off the railroad in order to save your life. The Goat Man I say the Goat Man, but it might be Goat Men. There seem to be two different stories that aren't related at all and are in different areas of Wisconsin relating to two different goat men. I'll start with the one from South Mill Road. It's basically a dirt road that leads to a dead end. It said, somewhere in the woods near this road is an abandoned house where the goat man, who was once a man, used to live. He was a violent alcoholic who supposedly beat his wife to death. On the same night he did that, he went out to beat the goats he owned. But while doing this, when managed to impel him with his horns and killed him. Being such an evil man and too angry to die, it said he came back as half goat, half man, and that he haunts the woods just out of Kiwasakum. There's a story of a hunter who in 2003 was out hunting deer, and while waiting in a tree, he began smelling something, something that smelled awful. When looking around, he noticed it, a half man, half goat, tan and gray in color. He described it as having the body of a goat with a human head and arms, and a long white beard. Supposedly, it was swearing and talking about there being a trespasser. The story goes that the hunter stayed in his tree till he saw the goat man walk away, and as soon as he saw that, he quickly exited the woods. The other goat man is from Hogsback Road, and this one, instead of having the body of a goat while the head of a man, actually has the upper body of a man and the lower half of a goat, as well as horns and sharp fangs, and a long beard. It's said that if you drive on Hogsback Road late at night, he might jump out in front of your car and cause you to crash. The sightings of this goat man go back to the 1870s. A newlywed couple was traveling along this road when their wagon broke down during the night. The man told his wife to stay as he went out looking for help. During the night, out of nowhere, a creature appeared in front of her, covered in red hair and with a horned head and a goat muzzle. She was terrified and stayed in the wagon and soon the creature disappeared. When the sun arose, she went out and saw the creature's footprints, which she followed and which ultimately and which ultimately led her to the remains of her husband. The Beast of Bray Road On a usually empty road just outside of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, supposedly exists a dogman-like creature. First being sighted in around 1936, this creature would become known as the Beast of Bray Road. The dogman is described to be about 6 feet tall with gray and brown fur, resembling a wolf with yellow eyes and pointed ears. Being a dogman means it's bipedal or staying on two feet with a humanoid body, just the face is like that of a dog. That being said, the creature does still run on all fours from time to time. Obviously it being described as a dogman like creature, some people think it might be a werewolf while others just think it's Bigfoot, just a different variant of the regular Bigfoot. 
While there have been no reports of an attack by this creature, it is said to be aggressive as any time it's been seen by someone or a car drives by, the beast of Bray Road gives chase and tries to scare the person off. Around 1980 and 1990, the reportings of the beast of Bray Road spiked, causing a reporter, Linda Godfrey, from the Walworth County Week to look into the stories of the beast and would soon believe that many of these accounts were in fact true and would write a book called The Beast of Bray Road, Tailing Wisconsin's Werewolf. And with the release of that book, the legend of the creature would spread more than ever the Wisconsin Man Bat. On September 26, 2006, at around 9.30 p.m., a father and his 25-year-old son were driving over an area on Briggs Road. As it was late in the night, their headlights were on and driving in a hilly area. While cresting one of those hills, they would notice something in the headlights of their car. It was a flying object. This flying thing was aiming for the car and was going to crash into it. But the son who was driving the car managed to turn at the last second dodging the creature that was flying head first towards them. They looked back and saw that the thing was a creature and that it already had changed the direction it was going, now flying straight up while screeching extremely loudly. Soon after this, both the father and the son suddenly got sick, exited the car and began vomiting. After both men had vomited everything in their stomach up, they went home hoping to feel better the next day. But the sickness would stay with them for an entire week with no medicines helping with the symptoms. After the sickness finally went away, both the father and son got together and tried to recollect what had happened that night. Both would then write a description of what they saw. A six to seven foot tall man with leathery bat-like wings that spanned 10 to 12 feet wide. They also believed the creature would either be gray or brown. This thing would end up being described as a man bat and this was actually not the first time the man bat had been witnessed in this area. There was another sighting in 1997 by a man who was working in the area who would describe a flying humanoid that seemed similar to the description of the man bat. Though there were some differences like it being described as more reptilian and greenish brown instead of gray brown. It should be said that the father and son who were driving didn't get a real good look at the creature as they were driving and it was diving straight into them. But the worker man who saw the flying lizard creature had witnessed it over them, just staying there, observing them for a couple of minutes before flying off. Strangely enough, in around the same area as the lizard sighting, in the same year of 1997, another father and son were looking for their dog when they claimed to have found the lizard man. Both the father and son, absolutely terrified of what they were witnessing, slowly backed away and ran away from the creature once they felt it was safe to run away from it. Tier 3 1975 Mellon UFO Sightings On March 13, 1975, several reports of strange lights within the sky from the town of Ashland, Wisconsin. While there were many reported sightings within the sky of Ashland, there was actually a rather interesting report of a UFO encounter that night, just 20 miles south of Ashland in Mellon, Wisconsin. It all started when the 15-year-old daughter of the Baker family, Jane Baker, decided to take her cat to the garage when she started hearing strange high tone noises. This grabbed her attention so she began to look around and try to find the source of the sound. That's when she looked upon a hill and she would describe seeing a silvery disc shaped object with a dome on top that glowed yellowish white and had red and green lights within the middle of it flashing on and off. The daughter would get the attention of the father and soon the whole family would see the same silvery object over the hill. The father went outside with the daughter to stare at it. The mother of the family viewed the object from within the house just outside of the window. As the father and daughter went out, they looked at the object from different places and in one of the places they were, they swore they heard metal banging coming from the object. The mother would call the police about the object and then a loud bang was heard. That loud bang was the object flying off. The next morning, the daughter went out to go investigate the area that the UFO was hovering over but couldn't find any substantial evidence that it left behind. By the family's recollection, the UFO hovered over the hill for about 10 minutes before it flew off. And the only thing to indicate that there might have been a UFO over the hill was that the snow was fluffed up. The Antigo Alien so during the year of 1974, within November, a family who owned a bar within Antigo reported seeing many lights within the night sky. And they weren't the only ones. Many people within the town of Antigo saw these lights as well. One resident of the town was an owner of a bar and a restaurant within the town and had a very strange encounter with a person. 
This happened on November 16th, a Saturday, in 1974. It was about 1.30 p.m. when a strange man entered her bar and restaurant. Standing at only 4 foot 5, he began walking to her, but his walk was described as more of a bouncing gait. It seemed as if he were struggling to walk. He quickly got up in Mrs. H's face and asked her in very quick English and in a full smile showing his teeth, you saw the bright light on Friday night. Confused, she said she actually saw it on Saturday and then the man just repeated himself four times. She was really weirded out because he was extremely assertive but also really small. His eye line was no higher than the top of the bar and he wore dark glasses to hide his face. She described them as having a dark complexion and shiny black hair. The man would repeat that it was just a meteor, but she wasn't really paying attention to what he was saying, more to what he looked like. And at one point, she caught the name of a town that was far away, Medford, and he just kept repeating the name of the town over and over again. But she wasn't really following along. And suddenly, out of nowhere, he threw his arms up and yelled, the whole world lit up, and then just walked out of the bar. Miss H stood there stunned for a while before going to check where he went and he seemingly just vanished but no one heard a car leave. Obviously Miss H would report this believing that she may have just had an encounter with an undercover alien or maybe even a men in black. Dundee UFOs Within the town of Dundee in around the 40s some strange lights started appearing. Now it weren't documented too well but what is documented well within the 40s in the town of Dundee was a crop circle appearing in 1947 and then nearly 20 years later there would be multiple people witnessing a strange circular object flying over the sky scaring cows. During this time there was two men within the town Bill Benson and UFO Bob Cohen, and they had noticed all this strange phenomena within the town and they decided to create an event for the people within the town and call it the UFO days which was basically where people would come together and talk about the strange UFO experiences within the town. Then in 1995, another crop circle would appear. Then three years later in 1998, Bill Benson and some of his group that are into the UFO stuff saw the strange orange light hovering over the Dundee mountain and then it just disappeared. A couple minutes later, four fighter jets were seen flying over Dundee mountain. Now earlier I mentioned UFO days and this is where this event slowly starts becoming more important with regard to the UFO sightings within the town of Dundee. People attending the UFO days see two pyramid shaped objects in 2000 over Long Lake. They also see the two objects join together and turn into a diamond and then just fly off. Two years later in 2002, yet again UFO days attendees see six glowing and flashing amber spheres within the sky. And then in 2004, again UFO days attendees see a triangular craft with Y-shaped lights moving over the night sky. And this one they have video of, which is what's probably playing on the video right now. Bill Benson isn't sure why there seems to be so much UFO activity near Dundee, but he assumes it has to do with the Dundee mountain. He believes there's something under it that keeps attracting UFOs to the area, but he doesn't know what it is. In 2021, Bill would attend his last UFO days, as that year he would pass away. 1952 Sturgeon Bay UFO Sighting On May 21st, 1952, many across Door County, Wisconsin would see something over Sturgeon Bay, a flying saucer, described as metallic and glowing bright red from the bottom. It was noted heading in a northeast direction and was in the area for about 50 minutes before people lost sight of it. With the writer from the Green Bay Press Gazette, Coro Lorenz, estimating it to be about 780 feet in diameter and held an altitude of about 40 miles. Funnily enough, a company would claim that this was actually one of their balloons. The General Mills Company claimed that it was one of their balloons that they were developing for upper atmosphere research. But when pressed on why the bottom was glowing red, they didn't have a response to that. And also the fact that the balloon was absolutely not 480 feet in diameter. Strangely enough, General Mills didn't deny the claims of people seeing something. They just took the credit and said it was their balloon. And for those wondering, yes, it is the same General Mills that makes the cereal. For some reason, it had an aeronautical division. One of the reasons for that division to exist was because the company didn't like the way the Air Force was handling UFO reports. So they set it out on themselves to find out what was actually in the air, which kind of incidentally proved that there were UFOs in the area. Because why else would they send out a balloon there? Either way, one thing remains consistent. The people who witnessed the Sturgeon Bay UFO do not believe it to be a balloon at all and truly have no idea what they saw over Sturgeon Bay. The William Balzac Encounter On December 2nd, 
1974, a farmer, William Bozak, was driving home and he saw something strange on the left side of the road. It was about 10.30 p.m. so it was pretty dark. So he got pretty close to try to look up what it was. He had to slow down because it was a foggy night. When he got close, he noted what it looked like. It seemed to be something made out of curved glass and he saw something inside. He saw a figure with its arms raised above its head. From his perspective, the curved glass shaped object was about 8 to 10 feet in height and saw that the person within the object was bullet shaped at the top, so kind of like a cone head. As soon as he took all of this in, and since he basically almost stopped to look at it, he freaked out and stepped on the accelerator, terrified by what he was seeing. And as soon as he did that, the inside of his car went completely dark, and all he could hear was what sounded like branches hitting his car. With this, Bozak got a better look of the person within the ship, described it as having hair sticking out of the side of its head, with ears that were protruding out about 3 inches and were shaped like a calf's ear and seemed to be wearing a tannish brown in color, skin tight diver suit. The person seemed to have its arms above its head, pointing straight up, and he also noticed that there was hair on the upper part of the body, but it had no beard. He couldn't see what it looked like from the waist down, because he had no visibility of it, and the object that it was in was reflecting all the light from Mr. Bozak's car. After that, the object disappeared. Mr. Bozak would return the next morning to where he saw the UFO, but would find no evidence of anything and kept the encounter to himself for about a month until he was no longer scared and then told his wife and his son. Eagle River UFO On April 18th, 1961, Joe Simonton was in his house getting ready to have breakfast. It was around 11 a.m. That's when he heard something strange, something he described, like a jet driving backwards on wet pavement. He went outside to look at what it was and saw a flying saucer, describing it as brighter than chrome. 12 feet in height and 30 feet in diameter, he noticed that there were exhaust pipes on one end of the UFO that were about 6 or 7 inches in diameter. The UFO would land and it would open up, revealing inside three occupants, three dark-skinned aliens. They stood at about 5 feet tall and he estimated they were weighing about 125 pounds. Something else he gathered is he assumed they seemed to be 25 to 30 and wore these dark blue slash black knit uniforms with turtleneck tops and had helmet like caps. He noticed that they were completely clean shaven and weirdly enough described them as Italian looking. I guess Italians aren't humans, they actually come from space or something. The three visitors stood out with a thermos like jug that shone as bright as the ship and although they did not speak, Simonton felt like they were asking for water and he just obliged them. He went back inside his house, filled the jug with water and then came back to the craft and handed it off to them. He described the thermos-like object as being heavier than aluminum but lighter than steel. As all three of the visitors were back inside their ship, Simonton had to enter their ship to give them water, noticing how strange of an interior the UFO had, describing it as a dull black with three extremely beautiful instrument panels. He noticed something strange while he was inside. One of the visitors was cooking on a flameless cooking appliance. After giving them back the water, one of the visitors, who seemed to be the leader, gave him what was being cooked, which was pancakes, or what he assumes alien pancakes might be, that were roughly 3 inches in diameter and had all these porous holes in them. Simonton would take a bite out of one of the pancakes and describe it as tasting like cardboard. He kept the other two. This is when the leader hooked something up to a suit, the hatch closed, and, and the UFO took off. Obviously, Simonton was off the ship at this point. And that was the encounter. Simonton would set the pancakes to be analyzed after he had told some UFO investigators about the encounter he had. While well, initially sent the nightcap and them refusing to actually look at the pancakes, someone else would. The Air Force dispatched a UFO investigator, J. Allen Hynek, and he got a hold of one of the pancakes and sent it to the Northwestern University Committee and the Air Force Technical Intelligence Center, where they analyzed the pancake and saw that it was made of flour, sugar, and grease. But it said that when it was analyzed, the wheat within the pancakes was of an unknown type. And as for Simonton, the whole experience left him jaded with the UFO groups and the like. As he expected to be believed and he had evidence and he had said himself he wasn't trying to make money off the whole situation. And well, everyone still didn't believe him and kind of called him crazy. He would basically say that like, you know, if a UFO came down again, I'm going to steal the UFO and this time I'm going to make money off of it. But no such thing happened. Supposedly Simonton did have more visits, but 
he was left so jaded by that first experience he just never told anyone, at least until 1970 when he told another UFO enthusiast. The Elmwood UFO Encounter On April 22, 1976, a police officer, George Wheeler, would encounter a UFO. Though this wasn't his first time, as he encountered one in 1975, and he wasn't the only one to actually have witnessed a UFO, as during 1976, the town of Elmwood itself had a rash of UFO sightings. Anyways, back to George Wheeler's encounter. He was driving over Tuttle Hill when he noticed that a quarry seemed to be on fire, and so he drove over to investigate what it was. When he finally got there, he noticed something, a saucer-shaped object, and he also noticed people within the object moving. He freaked out and said, my god, it's one of those UFOs again. He radioed this back to the station, and then his radio cut off. It wouldn't be until later when a farmer found Wheeler passed out sitting in his car on top of the hill. He was confused, and his car's electrical system was dead. Last thing Wheeler remembered was the UFO hitting him with a light. While he doesn't remember what happened after he got flashed by the blue light, he recalls a good 45 seconds before that, describing how the object almost started lifting up as soon as he pulled up and how the top of the object glowed orange while the bottom was silvery. He also said it was difficult to look at and described it as like looking into the sun. The police officer wouldn't be the only one to witness a strange light in the night sky, as there were several other people who saw a strange flying object at around 11 o'clock. Strangely enough though, a farmer that lived near the quarry doesn't remember there being anything in the night sky at around 11. After the encounter, the police officer Wheeler felt bad and after a day of feeling really bad, his wife took him to the hospital at the behest of the police chief and he would remain there for three days. Still in pain, the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him and so they sent him home. He would suffer from headaches and nightmares and went to his personal doctor asking for help and the doctor rehospitalized him but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. It said that within a year after the encounter, he died on February 12th, 1977. The Yewa Yuga UFO of February 2023, a mom and her son were visiting Yewa Yuga. They were over at a friend's place by some train tracks. When it was starting to get dark, that's when this lady's son pointed into the night sky and she looked up, seeing strange lights coming from the southwest. She then got her camera, pointed it to the sky, and started taking pictures. The pictures which you are seeing now in this video are of a strange disc-like object with lights under it. The person who took these photos has no idea what was in that sky, but she submitted it to a UFO investigation group so that they could analyze the photos. And what they found was that there seemed to be no manipulation of any kind on these photos, coming to the conclusion that these photos are authentic and that there is a UFO within these photographs. The Colfax Disc On April 19, 1978, a police officer, Mark Coltrane, was within the city of Colfax when he decided to stop and get some food. That's when he noticed something strange, a strange crackle coming from his radio. He started to look around, and that's when he noticed something in the sky, a metallic looking disc. It seemed to be moving towards him. So the police officer picked up the Polaroid camera he had on him and took some pictures. The police officer said the object was only in his vicinity for a couple of minutes before he lost sight of it. The Walworth UFO On January 8, 1959, Gordon Higgins was driving down the road when he saw something in the night sky, a UFO. It was around 5.15 p.m. when he saw the object hovering in the sky. It would then slowly begin to descend, and Gordon Higgins, wanting to get a good sight of the object, stopped his car and just began observing it. He said it took about 15 minutes to descend before it stopped, and when it stopped, it started to glow a bright yellow. It then shot off at incredible speed, flying away, leaving behind it a trail of sparks that changed from white to orange. Just the general UFO stats for Wisconsin, as always, that uh, list by SatelliteInternet.com that ranks the states by most UFO sightings ranks Wisconsin as the 23rd for number of sightings per person with 41 out of every 100,000 people at least having seen a UFO within the state and the state having 2,455 UFO reports in the National UFO Reporting Center database. The Belleville UFO Sightings Within Belleville, Wisconsin, in 1987, during the nighttime, many people within the town saw something strange, a UFO in the night sky. This seemed to mark a celebration for the town, as the following year they held a festival celebrating the viewing of the UFO. But while for some people this was just a fun celebration, for others it was a night they realized 
that UFOs had been in their town for a long time. One woman, Sherry Wilde, would realize on that day that she had been in contact with aliens for quite a while, according to her since she was about 8 years old and had been brought on board into their UFOs multiple times and she herself believes to be part of a hybrid program between grey aliens and humans. Sherry Wilde believes that that UFO sighting in 1987 was part of those that regularly visited her and that they just happened to be caught that day. Tier 4 Ghost Elephants Now this story has a lot of background information so, so I'm just gonna condense it. But basically, the town of Barbu was kind of recognized as the Ringling Circus headquarters and one thing circuses used to do and some still do now is obviously keep elephants and use them for entertainment you know and for the most part everyone knows that the way they did this was by abusing the creatures kind of forcing them you know beating them till they learn how to do the tricks and everything now we skip forward a lot of time to the 1930s we're back in the town of barbu this time this time not really anywhere near the headquarters of the ringling brothers circus just uh a little bit of ways and this family moves into this house which was recently built now things start out fine for the family but then but slowly over time strange things start happening the house is creaking a lot even though it was recently built some nights there's just sometimes there's just a lot of noise coming from somewhere the noise is happening a lot and the family starting to recognize it as very loud thumps and usually it's always happening late into the night it's eventually getting so loud that neighbors are starting to complain about the noise and that's when people start recognizing it's coming from an old barn at the back of the house and it was first recognized because a neighbor of the family asked them if they had a horse and the family said no and then they're like what's making that noise in the barn it would be described as if a sledgehammer was hitting wood now this didn't happen every night it just kind of happened every once in a while and one of the nights it happened the family called the police they were like someone's breaking into the barn someone's making all this noise can you please come down and arrest this person who's being a menace now originally the family thought that it was the town trying to run the family out of the town the police come uh they don't find anyone and they basically just tell the family like you're either gonna have to live with this or move out of the house and the family decides to move out but before that the night that all of that's going down after the police find nothing they're like well we found nothing we gotta go there's other emergencies now they go looking for their vehicle they came in and it's just missing it's just completely gone and they couldn't find it now i should add slightly before the missing car uh, some poltergeist like activity was happening in the house things were being thrown around so the cops knew something was up and they couldn't find anyone and they were kind of like you know something paranormal we're not gonna find anything here that's kind of why they decided to go the cops eventually do find their car which was a buick and it's a block away up a hill and based on the tire tracks it seemed to have been dragged by something and they also note that the tires were still locked in the park position but other than that the car seemed to be fine Anyways, eventually the family moves out and later on we learn something about the barn. Specifically, we go back to the Ringling Brothers and how the town and how the town of Barbo was basically the headquarters of the Ringling Brothers. Within that town there used to be a structure. Within that structure they trained the elephants. Again, the elephants did not live a very good life as circus animals, but eventually that structure was deconstructed and the Ringling Brothers moved somewhere else to train animals and stuff like that. Well, that wood was resold and apparently that wood that would become the barn where all these noises came from so it was then theorized that these were elephants that were haunting the barn for some reason they were attached to the wood instead of the area that they were trained in or whatever but that just kind of became the general story of everything that was happening in this town to this family though though there is something to dampen the possibility that this story might be true is the fact that as soon as the family moved out no more activity was reported eventually newspapers would come out with this story and a lot of people would come hoping to catch a glimpse of the ghost elephant or maybe hear the ghost elephant and you generally did not see that happening so it's gone down more as an urban legend and less of a haunting slash paranormal activity happening here phantom chickens this one's really strange and i don't know but it's basically what it sounds like. Within the town of Eau de Claire, there's a road, Chicken Alley, and it's said that at night if you drive down it, there's a chance of little ghost chickens walking in front of you. Supposedly as soon as you get close to them, they just literally vanish into the air. Um, other times people say like, you know, they run into the creatures, they step out because they feel bad, you know, and check the damage that their car has. Well, they get out of their car and there's no damage anywhere and there's no dead chickens around. Just a really weird thing. 
I wanted to make a why was the chicken crossing the road joke, but I couldn't come up with a punchline. Whitewater, Wisconsin. So to start off, Whitewater has a lot of haunted places and ghosts around. So I'm just going to group them all together under Whitewater. Throughout Whitewater's history, there are people who have claimed to be like spiritualist type people. He had a guy who immigrated from New York named Morris Pratt. He basically just decided he would dedicate his life to spiritualism. You had a woman named Mary Haynes Chinawith who one day just got on her knees, started speaking in tongues, and heard something tell her she could heal people. She didn't really believe she was a spiritualist, but more just someone sent down my God to heal people. But still, it's kind of like leaning towards the spiritualist side and far less in the Christian side of religion. The two would meet and basically build a large institution based on spiritualism. And since a lot of people at that time were interested, Interested in it a lot of people went and Pratt and Mary both got rich but basically like everyone else in the US as soon as the Great Depression hit they lost their business and lost a lot of money obviously this big spiritualist presence within Whitewater led to a lot of people believing there were witches congregating in the town and that they had this sect so much so that Whitewater gained the name the second Salem and there's a couple beliefs tied to this witches are staying in Whitewater first is about the water tower in Starin Park which is said to be a place where many witches rituals happen and is important to the witches. Secondly is the Forbidden Book, which is a book locked away in the Anderson local library that is said to drive anyone crazy who's read it and supposedly has led four people to deciding not to live anymore. I'll put it like that, so the rumor goes. There's sort of this Bermuda Triangle type thing known as the Witches Triangle within Whitewater and it's basically saying that Within this area of the town, every house, every building is haunted. And lastly for the witches, it is said that Mary Worth's grave is supposed to be haunted by an axe murdering witch, who you could see on Halloween nights. Some other paranormal related things not witch related that are within the town are the Hamilton House Bed and Breakfast, which is said to be haunted by the family that lived within it during the 1800s. And I already mentioned the Whitewater Lake monster, so, you know. Hunchyville. Now, this is an urban legend about a town named Hunchyville. The story begins with an exploitive and abusive circus owner who was mean to some little people he hired. And one day, they decided to get together, kill the owner, and run off into the woods. Supposedly, the little people killed the owner by cutting off his arms and legs. They soon would make a little town. It would become known as Hunchyville, and they would run those out who came to gawk at them or try to live within the town. It's said that if they caught you, they would then mutilate you, making you as short as them, and then forcing you to live within their small town. Supposedly though, when they, an albino kid stumbled upon the town, and treating the small people as equals, they decided to leave him alone and just let him live within the town as he was. Supposedly, he would grow big and tall, and be known as the defender of the town. So when more people came curious about Hunchyville, he would chase them out. Many people have tried looking for this town, but they can't find it. And so many people have tried looking for this town that there's even a find for those who trespass upon the land in which Hunchyville is supposed to be in. This legend is widely seen as myth simply because the story is a bit too fantastic. The Witherell House Built in 1853, the house is said to be cursed with death. The legend of the house goes that a family lived within the house, a mother, a father, and a daughter, and that the daughter suffered from some sort of mental illness. And one day, for no reason whatsoever, the father would kill the mother and the daughter, and then hang himself. And for the longest, many people believed that this was a real story, and that it was these deaths that would cause the house to become haunted. People say you could hear screaming coming from within the house, and that you could see the shadows of people within the windows of the house. But the truth is, that that story is simply just a story, and that there's actually no real evidence to show that a family died within the house. That being said, the state the house is in, and the fact that there's a fence to guard people from getting within, has kept the haunted house narrative alive. And even then, many people do believe that they've witnessed paranormal activity coming from within the house. The Hotel Schwamigan, located by Lake Superior, it is considered to be one of the most haunted hotels within Wisconsin. Originally built in 1877, would have to be rebuilt because of a fire that burned the original building down. A lot of the tales about the hotel being haunted revolve around room 312 and 314, where they say a man in a top hat walks between the halls, though that isn't the only reported paranormal activity. With strange noises, disembodied voices, and objects moving on their own having been witnessed, 
by hotel guests, the hauntings of Holy Hill. Much like the whitewater entries, there's several hauntings happening here, so I'm just gonna bunch them together in this entry. The first famous haunting of Holly Hill is the Hermit of Holly Hill. The story goes that a young man studying the priesthood named Francois Sabrio met a girl and fell in love and announced to everyone that he had planned on marrying her. This would bring disgrace to him and so the church and family disavowed him. He decided that he simply needed to leave the town he was in and come back later to when everyone was less mad. So he did and left for a year. He came back to find the woman he loved had been unfaithful to him and in a fit of rage murdered the woman. He would then flee to Quebec where he would find a map leading him to Holly Hill where it said another priest had built an altar to the Virgin Mary as she had blessed the land. And so Francois made it his mission to go there every morning and pray for forgiveness for breaking his vow of chastity and murdering his lover. And so that's what he did every day until he died even building a small chapel there. He eventually got to know the locals and everyone knew about his ritual. There's even a story of him getting a disease that made him paralyzed and that through praying through the Virgin Mary and continuing his ritual, he got cured. No one knows how he died. Some believe he joined the Civil War on the side of the Union and died in the war, while others said he just decided to leave once he felt he had been forgiven. It's said that on dusk, you can see the shadow of someone going to this altar, kneeling and praying. The Carmelite Cemetery is the burial ground for Holly Hill's caretakers. And it said if you take a photo there, a mist appears within the photos, something that you can't see in person. Some people say that within this mist, that they're able to see the form of people. Sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's just a hand, other times it's a face. There have also been sightings of some huge hairy cryptid that many believe to be Bigfoot or some sort of were-bear wolf. There was a sighting on November 9th, 2006, where a hunter was loading a deer carcass onto his truck. He climbed in the cab of his truck when he suddenly felt the truck beginning to move and shake. He looked in his rearview mirror and saw the bipedal creature completely covered in hair reaching into the bed of his truck and pulling out the deer he just put in there. He described it as a dark colored creature with the snout of a bear and pointy ears like a wolf. Absolutely terrified by what he saw, he immediately drove off. And lastly, the Tally Ho Haunted Pub, said to be haunted by the daughter of the former owner of the pub while it served as a bar and brothel. It said that her dad was abusive and that he had murdered her, though others just say she died at 31. The story goes that she was buried beneath the building under a pile of rocks and that on occasion you might see her appear in a white dress. Poltergeist-like activity has been reported within the pub, with things moving on their own, voices coming from the dark, the sound of footsteps coming from the basement. Cooks have been known to be attacked by nothing, and knives came very close to stabbing some people, seemingly coming off a magnetic strip by themselves. St. Killian's Catholic Cemetery, said to be haunted by many things, one of which is the ghost of a priest who is seen wandering between the gravestones. Another is a ghost said to ring a phantom bell from where the church once stood before it was burned down. Some people also claim they hear footsteps and voices of many different types of people, as well as strangely enough, chains rattling. As mentioned earlier, there was once a church there, but it was burned down, and it said that it was burned down by the fire department of the town. The reason for this was because there was many eyewitness reports of strange rituals happening after the church was abandoned. People claiming to see satanic rituals, black masses, and animal sacrifices happening within the basement of the church. And to stop evil from coming through the church, the town decided to burn it down. Or so the legend says. Tier 5 The Rock Lake Pyramids Simply put, these are pyramids at the bottom of Lake Mills. The general accepted theory is that if these do exist, that they were created by the Aztecs. And before white settlers moved into Wisconsin, that area had been known as Aztlatan and that the Aztecs came from there and then they moved south towards Mexico. The purpose of these pyramids were for rituals and knowing the Aztecs it lands on, they were built as sacrificial pyramids. The story goes that within Wisconsin there was a drought and that the native Aztecs started praying to the gods, hoping that it would rain and so they built the pyramids, sacrificed people for the gods and soon water started coming out of the pyramids, which is why the pyramid is now within a lake submerged. There's even reports of when settlers first came to the land, they noticed the tips of something jutting out of the lake. 
which is assumed to be the pyramids. Supposedly there was more than one pyramid with people swimming out to the lake, touching the tip of one and then, oh look, I saw another one. It doesn't really gain much significance until 1936. The Great Depression is kind of going on and Wisconsin needs a boost in the economy. So the Wisconsin government sends out surveyors to find national treasures and attractions. So, you know, you make ads about them and you kind of just grow the tourism within the state. And actually, the pyramids were not one of the things the Wisconsin government even wrote about. But people went investigating and the legend sort of grew and people wanted to come down and see if it was real. Now we skip a year later, in 1937, when a native to Wisconsin, a diver named Max Eugene Knoll, would go down and try to find the pyramids. Supposedly he finds them, he describes them as rising from a 36 foot bottom to its upper base, which is 7 feet from the surface, therefore being 29 feet high. The pyramid is in the form of a truncated cone, approximate dimensions, diameter upper base 3 feet, diameter bottom 18 feet, altitude 29 feet. Now this gets written about and people for the longest just believe it's there. There would be a survey done by the Milwaukee Public Museum in, in 1960 through 1961 and they found nothing. They thought people were assuming glacial deposits were the pyramids. But you know, between 1937 and 1960, it's a long time. So the myth of the pyramids persisted for a very long time and, and in that time it ingrained itself within Wisconsin lore and whatnot, at least sort of in a crypto archeology span sense. Interest in the pyramids wane when World War II started happening. Obviously, more important things started happening, so people paid less attention to it. Anyways, going back to how these pyramids were not found during that 1960 to 1961 exploration, the general consensus for these pyramids is that they do not exist and that they were just simply created in 1936 as a lie to sort of get people to come to Wisconsin, waste money, you know. This isn't helped by the fact that there was a man named Frank Joseph who wrote a book called The Lost Pyramids of Rock Lake, Wisconsin's Sunken Civilization, who rewrote the story of the origins of the pyramid and basically said, no, Aztecs didn't build this. It was actually Atlanteans and started adding supernatural and basically Hyperborean lore to Wisconsin. Well, one thing that doesn't help is that the man who wrote that book, Frank Joseph, was an actual Nazi or ex-Nazi, I should say. So his book, The Lost Pyramids of Rock Lake, actually were in fact a way to remove the idea that Aztecs would have been able to build this structure. And that's a very truncated history of the pyramids. And there's this really good uh, WordPress blog by JC Archaeology that goes very much in depth about all of this. If you're interested in all that, you know, give it a read. And you know, if you want to read about it, the link to JC's blog is going to be in the description in a Google Doc, so yeah. Bloody Bride Bridge Officially known as the Highway 66 Bridge, the story goes that a newlywed couple on their wedding night was crossing the bridge when they got into a horrible car accident, killing the bride. Very quickly, people started to notice something very strange happening on the bridge. The figure of a woman in a wedding dress that was all bloodied was appearing up and down the bridge. Supposedly, there's even an account of a policeman running into the woman by accident. He gets out of his car to check on the woman, only to find nothing, and gets back in his car, looks in the rearview mirror, and sees her there. The Rhinesy Cemetery Originally built by the Talmadge family and meaning to serve as a home for the spiritualist family, it said that they used their powers to speak with the dead on the land. The family would lose their oldest when he was just 19 years old to death coming unexpectedly and the father deciding to bury him on a hill and naming it Renzi Hill. Later the whole family would be buried here and this place would become a cemetery. Many stories revolve around this cemetery, some of which suggest that there's a gateway to hell in them. Specifically, it says that within the receiving vault of the cemetery is where the gateway is. There's another legend, this time about a witch's circle towards the back of the cemetery where it is said a mass grave for excommunicated nuns lays. The Tall Man House Haunting Starting in 1987 and beginning with the purchase of a bunk bed, strange things would begin to happen around the Tall Man family house home. First, the mother and father getting the strange eerie feeling. Soon, more and more incidents would begin to happen that would eventually lead the family to being absolutely terrified of staying within the house. A lot of this paranormal activity being similar to that of a poltergeist. Some of the activity includes a window being completely removed from the wall and placed neatly leaning on another wall. 
a garage door opening and closing by itself. Voices calling out, come here. Strange orange reddish eyes appearing outside of windows. One time, while the mom and dad were out, they called the babysitter. When the parents came back, the babysitter would tell them about how the kitchen chair started rocking itself back and forth and how the son, who was playing a board game, suddenly saw the board game bounce up and down off the table. All this activity would keep growing and growing until January 11th, 1988, when, while the mom was putting the kids to sleep, her and the children saw something, claiming something manifested itself out of nothing. Terrified, they began screaming, and soon, the whole family ran away from the house. Eventually, they realized all of this started when the bunk bed was brought into the home, and so, it was taken to a landfill where it would be destroyed. And since then, the activity has died down, but the story garnered a lot of attention, and people came to investigate the house, where some still report paranormal activity within it. The Talmud family would abandon the house though. Dartford Cemetery Supposedly, there's a lot of ghost and paranormal activity within the cemetery, with people claiming to have met the ghost of a Native American chief known as Highknocker, the last Winnebago chief in the area. There's also claims of people being pushed off the top of the Jackson Walker Mausoleum. Though the legend says you'll only get pushed off if it's Halloween night, it's also known that a lot of pioneer children were buried in the cemetery, many of who died due to diseases, and it's said that you could encounter the ghost children at night, as well as sometimes hear strange chanting from the headstones, and other times be scratched by invisible forces. The Amory Haunted Church also known as the East Emmanuel Lutheran Church, was built in the 1870s. While little is known in the reason as to why this church might be haunted, what is known is the very first incident in which people started to realize that something else was taking residence within the church. Happening in 1981, a reverend suddenly started to hear the church bell ring. Recognizing that no one should be ringing the bell, she ran to the church, only to find it completely empty. After that, the bell would ring itself more frequently, and that's when people who went to the church started to hear noises, describing them as voices coming from empty pews, or sometimes within the walls of the church themselves. One time, people even claimed to have heard what sounded like a pot-like dinner within the basement of the church, and when they went down to investigate, found there was nothing. Tier 6 T.B. Scott Manor so, within the city of Merrill in Wisconsin, there lies the T.B. Scott Manor. And to get into this, I have to get into before the town was called Merrill. It was known as the village of Jenny, which was the name of a native chief's daughter who lived there before the town was built. Legend says that while Jenny was being born, she died. And so the chief of the village prayed to a great spirit to make a burial site a sacred place. Now, we fast forward, 1884. T.B. Scott decides that he's going to put his manor on this sacred land and so begins construction. And just before it's completed, T.B. Scott would die. And the reason for his death is believed to be a curse. But T.B. Scott would not be the only one to die. Soon his family would meet a series of unfortunate events as well. His wife would only die a year after him. One of his sons would be stabbed in Chicago. It wasn't just only his family that would be affected though. Anyone who tried to claim the house would also be hit. A man named Edward Cool would own the house in 1899 he would soon lose all of his money and become insane. Another man, John Barasanti, on his way to claim the mansion, would be stabbed. Another man, Charles W. Gibson, would own an office in the mansion, and he just disappeared one day. And the last person supposedly affected by this curse was a man known as Popcorn Dan. It's said that he was the caretaker of the mansion. One day, he would take a voyage. The voyage he took? The Titanic. So, general idea here being that the land is cursed if you step foot on it and, you know, and violate the sanctity of it, you'll get cursed and eventually die. The Sheboygan Asylum, actually called the Sheboygan County Comprehensive Health Care Center. It was built in the 1940s to care for the elderly, mentally ill, and developmentally disabled. Though four years later, that would change. As in 1944 through 45, it would be renamed as Camp Sheboygan to put Italian and German World War II prisoners to work in the fields. Though it would go back to being a place to help those who needed help, and even ended up offering more forms of help, such as drug and alcohol rehabilitation, as well as helping those with chronic illnesses. But these programs would start to be phased out in 1988, and eventually the hospital closed in 2002. 
Throughout the time the hospital was still active, and even after, rumors of ghosts are said to haunt the asylum. Some say you could hear the humming of a little girl, feel the cold touch of a ghost, have your hair pulled, doors slamming and opening by themselves, people whispering in your ears, and screaming throughout the halls. And it is also said that several nurses, throughout the time the hospital was still operating, would take their own lives in the hospital, adding to the haunted history of the asylum. The Octagon House in the town of Fond du Lac is a house known as the Octagon House, known for its varied history and many secrets. The house has a very strange build, with many rooms that lead nowhere, secret passageways, and false fireplaces that lead to a hidden stairway. The theory goes that these were built in order to help runaway slaves make it north to Canada, and that the house was part of the Underground Railroad. Another part of the house's history is the fact that these rooms and this house was used to produce alcohol during the Prohibition era. The house is said to be haunted by the original family who built it, the Brown family, with the house originally having been built in 1856, with the father and the man who built the house dying in the Battle of Antaeum on September 17, 1862, during the Civil War. Some of the reported paranormal activity within the house is being touched by cold invisible hands, being pushed downstairs, the sounds of children playing, and full body apparitions of different members of the family, as well as sometimes strange eyes staring at you from the ends of dark tunnels within the house. The Town of St. Nazians This town would become famous due to a Roman Catholic Church father fleeing from Germany to Wisconsin for religious persecution due to his beliefs not exactly aligning with the churches. Said to have made it to this town in 1854, it would later be written in a newspaper that he was led by a divine white heifer, which is a cow. The father, Ambrose Ostwald, would become sick in 1873 and start to die. It was said that on his deathbed, there was one other person with him, a man named Anton, and Anton witnessed some strange behavior happening while Oswald lay dying, such as banging coming from the walls and Oswald reaching for someone who wasn't in the room. Oswald would end up dying on February 26, 1873. After his death, the place where Oswald would be buried, a tomb, was not completed so it was placed in a crypt in a coffin. It wouldn't be until several weeks later when the coffin was reopened and he would be moved into the tomb. When they opened up the coffin, they realized something. It seemed as if Oswald had hardly decayed. He would become known as an incorruptible, which is basically a phenomenon that specifically refers to Roman Catholic Church members who once they have died, decay at an extremely slow rate, making it look as if death hasn't even touched them. His coffin would yet again be opened many years later, on October 4th, 1926, because his body was being moved again. And the same thing was still noted, 53 years after his body had been moved, his rate of decay still seemed to be extremely slow. After Oswald's death, strange things would begin to happen around the town. Lots of natural disasters would occur, and some strange phenomena would begin happening around the town. Many people believe that Ambrose Oswald cursed the town while on his deathbed. The Maribel Caves Hotel, aka Hotel Hell. Built in the 1900s, this hotel is said to be extremely haunted, due in large part to the huge history within it. The building that would become the Maribel Caves Hotel was burned down three times, first in the 1920s, and the last time it was burned down was in the 1930s, where it said everyone in the building died as the fire raged on while they were asleep. When the building was being reconstructed, the skeletons of those who died would be found. There's also the tale of a hotel guest going crazy and killing a bunch of people within the hotel and afterwards unaliving himself. It's also said to be haunted by witches who conducted rituals just outside the hotel. Supposedly one of the rituals they did opened up a portal to hell, but the tale goes that another witch came and sealed it, as this other witch was a good witch who was trying to help people fight off the demonic things brought by the evil witches. Lastly, this hotel was owned by Al Capone during the Prohibition era and was used in the bootlegging business to produce alcohol. Some other paranormal activity that has been noted within the hotel is blood coming out of the walls, the ghost of a little boy being seen on the second floor window, being touched by cold hands, feeling threatened in the basement, and that supposedly if you shine a flashlight within the second floor, something will shine a light back at you. Another local tell is that if you look down the local well that's near the hotel, 
They say you could see the portal to hell, that it's still there. The building no longer remains standing. As in 2006, the building was gutted, and in 2013, a storm knocked it all down. But the history of the paranormal activity that occurred still remains. The Mo Lutheran Church, said to have been burned down in the late 1900s due to some accident. The legend goes that the fire claimed the lives of over 30 people, and that these 30 lost souls were the first to haunt the church. Another legend about the church takes place during the 50s. In some time around 1950, a story claims that a woman would hang herself from the bell tower after she lost her child. People claim that you could see the ghost of the woman hanging from the bell tower, or that sometimes she'll be walking through the church with her baby. Tier 7 The Pechtico Fire On October 8, 1871, one of the deadliest fires within Wisconsin would begin to burn. As an eruption of flame came over the Pechtico River, it managed to destroy the entire town burning down every single building. Deaths were estimated to be between 1,200 to 2,500. The reason for such a large discrepancy was because all the local records were lost in the fire. The fire burned at least 1,875 square miles of forest and destroyed 17 communities. Only those who were near a body of water managed to survive the firestorm. There's a mass grave for those who died with at least 350 unidentified people buried in it and cost at least $169 million worth of damages. The Cedar Grove I-43 Fog Crash On October 11, 2002, on the I-43 near Cedar Grove, there was unusually thick fog that day. It was extremely dense, and it made visibility extremely low. It said that around 719, around a curve, two cars got into an accident. The issue with this was that the people behind them could not see that there was an accident ahead of them. So cars going at highway speeds began crashing into each other. It said that in total, 51 vehicles were involved in the accident. By the time people were aware to slow down and to avoid the scene, at least 10 lives had been taken and another 36 were injured. The 2008 Wisconsin Flood During the summer of 2008, in the first half of June, there would be several southern counties within Wisconsin that received a foot of rainfall. This coupled with record high snowfalls the previous winter, left rivers reaching historic high stream flows, which led to one of the biggest flooding events for the Mississippi and Wisconsin rivers. This would also unfortunately lead to Lake Delton and the Wisconsin Dells to breach its dam, destroying homes, and causing the government to declare 31 counties within the area disaster areas, with at least 40,000 homes and 5,000 businesses being damaged. The government estimated the total damage from the flood to be about $1.2 billion. Thankfully, no one would be killed or injured when the dam broke. The Colfax Tornado On June 4, 1958, an F-5 tornado would form around St. Croix and make its way all the way to near Colfax. Among that time that the tornado traveled 33.7 miles, other tornadoes would also begin to form around it. Two F-4s, an F-3, and an F-2 with both F-4s and the F-5 causing fatalities. The F-5 in total would take 21 lives. 15 of them were from the town of Colfax, while one of the F-4s took 4 lives and the other took 3. In total, this tornado outbreak would take 28 lives and cause massive amounts of destruction to the northwestern part of Wisconsin. The New Richmond Tornado, 1899 on June 12, 1899, one of the most devastating weather events in Wisconsin would happen. Within the town of New Richmond, the Golmar Brothers Circus was in town, and so a lot of people came to see the circus. But unfortunately, a tornado began to form. Before the tornado reached the town of New Richmond, it had already taken three lives. The tornado would finally hit Richmond just shortly after the circus ended, running through the very center of the town and completely devastating the town, with it at least destroying 300 buildings. The tornado would end up taking at least 117 lives and causing 150 injuries, making it the ninth deadliest tornado in US history. The Mokohi Mine Cave-In On February 10, 1943, two men would be working within the mine, trying to fix some supporting beams, when suddenly, the mine would cave in, killing those two. Soon rescuers came, trying to dig out and rescue workers within the cave, and while attempting to do this, six people would be caught in a second cave-in that would also end up taking their lives. There were other rescuers stuck in the cave-in, but they also managed to escape. Some were injured. In total, these two cave-ins would take eight people's lives, 
This is one of the worst mining disasters within Wisconsin. The Big Blue Crane Collapse On July 14, 1999, a 567-foot crane that was used to construct the Milwaukee Brewers Miller Park Stadium would come crashing down on it, killing three workers. The way they died was that the crane was lifting a section of the stadium roof that weighed about 450 tons, and it collapsed while lifting this. And while collapsing, it landed on the platform that the three workers were standing on. OSHA would find that there were several factors that led to the crane's collapse, such as the wind and the soft soil. For one, the wind was going at least 20 to 21 miles per hour that day, with wind gusts reaching 26 to 27. Now the boom of the crane, which is the long arm of the crane used to transport heavy objects, was only rated for 20 miles per hour. The other factor was the soil. OSHA found that the crane sunk about a foot into the soil when it was initially lifted to the roof section earlier that morning. After the incident was cleared, a new crane was installed. The Great Flood of 1993 with an unusually snowy winter and a summer that was bringing down a lot of rain, major flooding would begin. Starting on June 16th, the Black River Basin would begin the flood over and the rain would not let up. Then on June 25th, the Mississippi River and many major tributaries would begin to see heavy rainfall, causing every major river within Wisconsin to begin the flood. Soon flash flood warnings would be sent out and later at least 20 dams would end up being topped, broken, or washed away. The damage this flooding caused is insanely high, with $800 million worth of damages to crop and soil, $46 million to residential housing, and an estimated $31 million lost worth of businesses. The federal government would declare 46 of the state's counties disaster areas, with this flood taking a total of combined 50 lives within the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Minnesota. Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Illinois. The Bayview Massacre On May 5, 1886, on the shores of Lake Michigan, one of the bloodiest labor incidents within Wisconsin would occur. Occurring after four days of worker demonstrations, this occurred when around 1,500 workers were marching towards Bayview Rolling Mills. The state militia were protecting the manufacturing plant and had ordered the protesters to stop at least 200 yards away, but the protesters didn't, and they kept walking. That's when the state militia fired into the crowd, killing seven people. After the gunfire, the marchers dispersed. The marchers were protesting for an eight-hour day law, which basically wanted a normal workday to be eight hours. But unfortunately, after this incident, the marchers would stop, as people were too scared to lose their lives. The Battle of Wisconsin Heights, 1832. On July 21st, 1832, a chief, Black Hawk and his band of Sauk, Fox, and Kickapoo tribes retreated towards the Mississippi as U.S. troops were approaching him. While the U.S. militiamen had about 750 troops on their side, Black Hawk only had about 120 or so warriors, with the rest within his little group being non-combatants and they were about 700 people. As the group of Native Americans were trying to cross the Wisconsin River in order to lose the militiamen, the battle broke out. In the end, at least 70 Sauk or Fox tribesmen would be killed. Meanwhile, the militia would only suffer seven or eight casualties. Tier 8 Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Ghoul, born on August 27, 1906, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. He has two confirmed murders and seven suspected. He confessed to murdering Mary Hogan, the tavern owner from Pine Grove, Wisconsin, who he shot and killed in 1954. His second confirmed murder was Bernice Warden a hardware store owner in Plainfield, Wisconsin. She disappeared in November 1957. Her son, Frank Warden, went to the store around 5 p.m. on November 16, 1957 to find the cash register open and blood stains on the floor. Gein went to the store that morning to buy a gallon of antifreeze, and the cell slip for the antifreeze was the last receipt that Benice Warden wrote. The police arrested Gein while he was at the West Plainfield grocery store, and they searched his farm. They discovered the decapitated body of Warden in a shed. She was hung upside down at her ankles. She was shot with a .22 caliber rifle. The authorities found a lot of human remains in his house and property, including masks made from the skin of female heads, including the face mask of Mary Hogan. They also found her skull in a box. Gein had Bernice's head in a burlap sack and her heart in a plastic bag. After his arrest in 1957, Gein was found mentally unfit to stand trial and was committed to a psychiatric institution. He spent the rest of his life there until his death due to lung cancer on July 26, 1984. Jeffrey Dahmer 
also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. He was an American serial killer who was born on May 21st in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and died on November 28, 1994. Dahmer's crimes involved the sexual assault, murder, dismemberment, and sometimes cannibalization of 17 young men and boys. He has 17 victims and most of them were found in his apartment. I'll only talk about a couple of his victims since this video is already long enough. His first murder was a man named Stephen Hicks. The murder was committed in 1978 on July 18th. Dahmer picked up Stephen while he was hitchhiking to a rock concert at Chippewa Lake Park, Ohio. He agreed to go with Dahmer to his home, since he was the only one there that day, under the guise of a few beers. Dahmer would dissolve his flesh with acid and crush his bones with a sledgehammer and scatter them in the woodland behind his family home. His last murder was of a man named Joseph Bradoft, in which he committed the murder on July 19th of 1991. Joseph was strangled by Dahmer and left on his bed sheet for two days and on July 21st, he removed the bedsheet and found his head covered in maggots, decapitated the body and cleaned the head and placed it in his refrigerator. He also used acid on the body along with the bodies of the two previous victims within the previous month. Dahmer was caught on July 22nd after he tried to murder another victim named Tracy Edwards. He escaped and flagged down two police officers in which they got to Dahmer's apartment and he, and he invited them in and tried to explain the situation. But the police ended up finding Polaroids of dismembered human bodies. Dahmer then tried to fight the officers but was quickly overpowered by them and was arrested. He confessed in the early hours of July 23rd. On July 25th, he was charged with four counts of first degree murder and on August 22nd, he was charged with a further 11. He was convicted on February 17, 1992. On November 28, 1994, Dahmer would leave a cell to conduct his assigned work detail with two fellow inmates. Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. They were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for about 20 minutes. Scarver attacked both Jesse and Dahmer and killed both of them. Chai Sua Vang. On November 21st, 2004, the six-year National Guard veteran would open fire on a group of hunters in what is considered a mass shooting and also considered the only mass shooting involving hunters. Vong would end up killing six of the eight hunters with an SKS 7.62 by 39 semiotic rifle. This all seemingly started when Chai Soo Vang went onto property that wasn't his, found a deer stand, climbed it, and just started spying on the family that owned the land, who were currently at that time within the cabin. One of the family members would spot him and radio to the deer stand, asking who was in the deer stand. After making a quick head count, he realized it wasn't someone from his group. So the man and several others went out to the deer stand to escort whoever was out there out of the property and making sure that that man was not allowed on the property, that man being Chai So Vang. After escorting Vong out, the family and a group of friends wanted to make sure that he was truly out of their property and on the way to the edge of their property, they would end up being attacked. Vang would open fire on the group as they approached him killing six of the eight in the group and the only reason the others weren't killed was because his rifle was out of ammo. The reason for all of this was a clash of egos. Vang didn't like the way he was talked to and the way he was treated while he was on the property and the man who owned the property, Bob Krauto, was said to be very prideful and was considered a loudmouth and a hothead and Vang felt disrespected. Vang would be convicted on six counts of first degree murder three counts of attempted first degree murder and would be imprisoned for life at the Anamosa State Penitentiary. Alton Coleman Born November 6, 1955 and died by lethal injection on April 26, 2002 in a Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. He committed a crime spree through six states between May and July 1984 in which it resulted in him killing eight people. He received three death sentences in three different states. He was born in Waukegan, Illinois and Illinois law enforcement knew him very well since he committed sex crimes six times between 1973 and 1983. He was diagnosed with mixed personality disorder and others. He married Deborah Brown who was borderline intellectually disabled because she suffered head trauma as a child and she was diagnosed with dependent personality disorder. I mention her because she did participate in the murders caused by Coleman. The first murder was a 9 year old girl named Vernetta Wee. Coleman befriended her mother and he ended up abducting the girl. He took her to Wakugan. Her badly decomposed body was found on July 19th in an abandoned building four blocks from Coleman's grandma's apartment. He ended up murdering seven other kids in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. In July 17th, he returned to Illinois and stole a car. 
Then he stole another car and murdered a 75-year-old street owner, Eugene Scott. Three days later, he was arrested in Evanston, Illinois. The Slender Man Stabbings On May 2014, Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser would lure a friend out, Payton Leitner, into the woods. They would then proceed to stab their friend 19 times using a knife and just left her out in the woods to die. Thankfully, Leitner would survive, making it out of the woods and getting help. After receiving help, the police were called and Wire and Geyser were called in by the police to question why they did it. The girls would tell the police they were trying to offer up Peyton Leitner as a sacrifice to the Slender Man, a fictional creepypasta character from the internet. Since the two girls had the intention of killing Peyton Leitner, they would both be charged with first degree homicide, meaning despite both being 12 at the time, they would be tried as adults. Morgan Geyser though would be revealed to have early onset schizophrenia and during the court proceedings, it would be revealed that she was suffering from mental illnesses since she was an adolescent, so she would end up being transferred to a state mental hospital and then on August 2016 pleaded not guilty because of insanity. Before the conviction could go to a jury, she reached a deal with the prosecution and pleaded guilty in September 2017. The plea deal made it so that she was criminally liable and served her sentence out by continuing her treatment for the mental illness in a mental health facility and a judge would end up ordering her for a maximum commitment of 40 years. Meanwhile, Anissa Wire initially pleaded not guilty due to mental disease or defect in September 2016, but a year later would plead guilty to a charge of second degree homicide. And in September 2017, a jury found her not guilty due to mental disease and would be committed for 25 years in the Winnebago Mental Institute in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. But on July 2021, she was granted a conditional release because a judge ruled that she no longer posed a significant risk of danger to herself or others. The conditions for her release is that she's tracked by GPS all day and is under supervision from her case managers at all times until she reaches the age of 37. Actually, update, as of September 12, 2023, she no longer needs the GPS tracker and her victim and paint liner has recovered and has gotten her life back on track. It was a long road of recovery for her, but she's managed to live her life not held down by what happened to her and has even expressed an interest in the medical field. Edward Wayne Edwards Born in Akron, Ohio in 1933, in an autobiography Edwards wrote, he claims to have grown up in an orphanage and that the nuns that were supposed to take care of him abused him both physically and emotionally. He has five confirmed murders and has over 15 suspected. His first known murder was in Ohio 1977. He murdered William Billy Lavaco and his girlfriend Judith Straub. The second pair of murders were a double homicide, happening in Concord, Wisconsin in 1980 when Tim Hack and Kelly Drew were stabbed and strangled. They were referred to as the Sweetheart Murders. His connection to the case held no basis till almost 29 years later when he was connected to it with DNA testing. In 2009, Edwards was arrested for murder in Louisville, Kentucky. In 2010, he pleaded guilty to the murders of Billy Lavaco of Doylestown, Ohio, Judith Straub of Sterling, Ohio, and Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, both of Jefferson, Wisconsin. Walter E. Ellis also known as the Milwaukee Northside Strangler, he has seven known victims, but he is thought to have killed more than 10 people. On October 10, 1986, Walter killed Deborah Harris, and her body would be found in an abandoned building in Milwaukee. On October 11, 1986, he murdered Tanya Miller. He would then murder Irene Smith on November 28, 1992. And on April 24, 1999, another victim, Florence McCormick, would be found strangled. The body of Sheila Freire would be found on June 27, 1995. Then, almost a year later, another body, Joyce Ann Memes, would be found strangled on July 20, 1996. And lastly, Orthrene C. Strokes, whose body would be found on April 27, 2007. After Ellis was convicted, he was transferred to service sentence at South Dakota State Penitentiary in Suey Falls, South Dakota. Soon after he arrived in prison, his health began to deteriorate. He was transferred to a prison hospital and was diagnosed with diabetes. He died on December 1st of 2013 due to his diabetes. Lorenzo Fain Born on April 2nd, 1971 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, he has six victims in total and his span of crimes lasted through 1989 
the 1993, before he started murdering people. He already had a record of robbery, burglary, assault, and auto theft. He did spend several years in juvenile prisons, where he was physically and sexually assaulted. In 1989, he was released from prison and soon left Milwaukee and moved in with his grandmother in East St. Louis, Illinois. He would live there for four years. On July 14, 1989, Lorenzo murdered and sexually assaulted a six-year-old boy named Ari Hunt, not far from his grandmother's house. On October 16, 1989, Nicole Willis, a 16-year-old, was found beaten to death a few hundred meters from East St. Louis High School. Lorenzo is a suspected murderer in the case, but he denied any involvement in it. On March 20, 1992, 14-year-old Latondra Dean was sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. On July 20, 1992, 9-year-old fell in flood, was sexually assaulted, and strangled to death. On June 25, 1993, 17-year-old Glenda Jones was sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. On July 23, 1993, he murdered 17-year-old Faith Davis, who lived next door to him. He attacked her in her apartment. Lorenzo sexually assaulted her and stabbed her to death. He then tried to set her apartment on fire to erase the evidence. He was spotted by witnesses and was identified as Lorenzo Fain. Police soon interrogated him and examined his clothes in which they found blood stains. He was arrested and eventually confessed to robbing her apartment but not killing her. On August 4, 1993, they examined the fingerprints at Faith's apartment and they matched that of Ari's murderer. They then confronted Lorenzo about their findings and he admitted to murdering both Ari and Faith. His grandma found out about his crimes and decided to talk to him and then he admitted to killing the Tondra, Dean, Fallon Flood, and Glenda Jones. On September 2009, with DNA testing, he was linked to the murder of 32-year-old Rita Scott who had been beaten to death with a blunt object on September 5, 1989 in Milwaukee. David Allen Van Dyke Born on January 14, 1959, his crimes happened between July 1979 and April 1980, where he murdered four women and two men at their own residences in northern Milwaukee. He gained entry into their homes by asking the user telephone or bathroom. He then bludgeoned, beat, or stabbed the victims to death with items from their homes. He would then steal items from their homes and leave the scene, but leave the weapons he used to murder the victims. His first victim was 69-year-old Della May Leggins. He stabbed her to death on July 19, 1979. On August 10, 1979, David stabbed 78-year-old Florence Buckard in her home 43 times. Her body was discovered due to two volunteers who were there to deliver a hot meal to her. They found her body at the bottom of the basement stairs. David beat 79-year-old Helen Ronsky to death in her living room. On November 8, 1979, he put her body in her bedroom covered by a sheet. Her body wouldn't be discovered until November 9, 1979 by her son. The investigators found partial prints but failed to match them with anyone. On July 25, 1980, he would bludgeon Charles Golston with a claw hammer. His friend found him unconscious. Charles would spend three months in a coma but would pass in early May of 1980. On March 3, 1980, 49-year-old Bernard Ford died while on his bed due to receiving several blows to his head. Police first charged his roommate with murder because his neighbor gave the police a note that Bernard gave them, saying that if anything happened to him, it was his roommate's fault. The roommate was released because his fingerprints did not match those found on the scene. On April 14, 1980, a 28-year-old woman allowed Van Dyke entry into her residence upon his expressed interest in purchasing her vehicle. While she went upstairs to retrieve an item, he trailed behind, but on her turning away from him, he forcefully grabbed her by the throat and threw her to the ground. Inadvertently causing her to fall, he proceeded to ruthlessly stomp on her head. Despite her injuries, she managed to rise, prompting him to strike her in the head with an ashtray. He used shards of glass from the ashtray and a wine bottle to inflict cuts upon her, tenderly tracing her wounds with his fingers. Despite her ordeal, she summoned the strength to flee her home, seeking help initially at a neighboring residence, where the occupant refused her entry and subsequently at a bar, where she received aid. Van Dyke fled the scene after stealing $118. On April 25, 1980, he would sexually assault and beat 30-year-old Helen Louise Bellamy to death in her home with a tire jack. On March 23, 1980, Van Dyke faced arrest in connection with the attempted burglary, during which his fingerprints proved the match. Following his apprehension, he was escorted to an interrogation room where he underwent hours of questioning, where he confessed, sometimes crying. Subsequently, he was formally charged with six counts of first-degree murder, one count of attempted murder, and one count of armed robbery. Hey guys, thank you for making it this far within the video. It was a lot of work, and I appreciate you guys watching it all the way till the end. Uh, thank you, and have a good day, or good night, if you're gonna sleep. Bye!